I am joined today by activist, speaker, re-entry specialist, and author Donna Hilton. Donna brings an authentic voice to her work based on her own unthinkable traumatic childhood experiences and incarceration at the age of 20, for which she served 27 years. However, today she is one of the most prolific advocates for women's rights and prison reform. It's an honor to meet you, Donna. Thank you for being here today on Motivational Mondays. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. Thank you. Yes. Well, to get right in, you know, I... I guess there's a starting point in some ways where you, as I mentioned, were 20 years old and you did get entered into the, the prison system. But prior to that, leading up to that, a big part of your platform is discussing like the childhood traumas and the things that, abusive things that happened to you along the way that got you there, so to speak. So I was wondering when you wrote your book, which is your memoir, which is a little piece of light, a memoir of hope, prison and life unbound, what prompted you to write that book and what were you hoping people would get out of it? Well, what prompted me to write it well, actually was the um, encouragement of uh, especially Dan Pearson, others around me saying that it would be um, more impactful um, to reach people by putting my story into words. Why? Because as much as I was speaking, there's always going to be a demographic of folk that would not be, you know, accessible to you know, the conversation or right. even want to know about the conversation because so it comes with that cloud, right? Mm -hmm. that, that, that. And so, yeah, so I just said, okay, all right. It took me a minute to say, okay, but. <laughs> Why was that like a, a situation where you didn't know if you wanted to be that vulnerable? Like, I mean, because you are, it's, it's cathartic, I know, writing, but then there's also like, do I really want to, you know, go there? So what was your reservation? I think, you know, as much as you heal, there's still a piece of you that says, hmm, maybe not. Mm -hmm. And how vulnerable do you want to be to the world, right? And so how much of that vulnerability do you want to show? Um, but then, I, you know, I prayed, right? And, um, and I was listening and having conversations with Dan Pearson and multiple conversations and with other people. And, and this is what did it. I was at a speaking event with uh, Piper Kerman in Brooklyn and we were talking about our stories and like how she got, you know, how she did Orange is New Black, her whole, that's her, like, that's her story, mine, yeah. Locus of Light, what happened with, you know, mine was riddled with abuse and, and, and trauma. And it was me speaking, this woman stood up uh, and I don't know, there's an energy that shifted in, this, in, the, in, the, in the place and I felt it. And, 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 and something told me to like to be still in this moment. And actually the whole place got still, mm. right? And I just knew something was coming. And she stood up and she said, thank you. She said, because this is the first time that I'm sharing that I was hurt, mm. that someone hurt me. I never told anyone. I didn't think I could because I felt so alone. And I felt it, you could feel it, like you could feel it was so tangible. And it was in that moment that something shifted in me and I recognized the power of that written word really and truly can have and does have on people. So I got up off the stage, went to her and held her in that moment because that was her moment. And it was to honor her for even being able to feel comfortable enough and not alone anymore to be able to share that. And so it was that moment, that was the deciding moment for me. And you do mention when you, uh, you have mentioned in past interviews, when you went to prison at 20 and when you got in that environment, you began to realize almost immediately, I guess I would assume through talking to other inmates that you were not alone, whereas you thought you had been I guess that could make you feel very isolated. You said you tried to tell people, they thought you were lying. You had tried to get out of that situation all, all your life. Um, but here you are meeting women who are saying, hey, me too. For men that opened up as well, and that's a lot, right? And you know, you know, most of us don't speak and open up and tell because we don't feel believed or, you know, or ashamed and we start, and, and, and a lot of that comes with blaming yourself or whatever mm -hmm. happens to you, we to own that, especially kids, not be clear, like I was a child. Yeah. <laughs> I was still a child at 20. I was still a kid, young person, mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and, and we don't give children the opportunity to tell their truths and to really believe them, you know? So like when we hear children speak about things, like we should really believe them. 
Yeah. Right. And especially when it comes to, I know, I mean, not to make it a stigma about African-Americans, but for me, I know a particular demographic of African-Americans from the South, a certain generation. When I was a kid, you know, we were told, you know, to be at a, don't be in grown folks business and you don't have nothing to say really. And, you know, they kind of almost like suppress kids emotions and not yeah. allow them to be little adults, which is what they really are. And they have something to and say. Little people. <laughs> yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. little people and they have just as much of a right to speak and to share as anyone else and we always um silencing kids right and so yeah. when i went into prison to get back to really what your point was i went into prison i was still a kid right and i was an adolescent as far as yeah. the system is concerned but i was as far as the world is concerned as well so i thought i was alone in my pain and my trauma i thought i was alone at first of all i was i didn't realize i was carrying all that stuff like it mm -hmm. was in my baggage it was my fault everything Right. And you don't realize that until yeah. you realize it. And so when I real, one of the things I started realizing throughout, you know, my time in the prison system was that, oh, my God, these women that I'm meeting had very similar stories. So it was like, wait a minute. And one day dawned on me, why are all of us here? Mm. Like the, 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 the common theme, the thread was no one listened mm -hmm. or we didn't tell. Yeah. So those yeah. Two, two things go well, hand in hand and majority started from childhood and a lot of black and brown girls, a lot of black girls, right? And black boys too. But, mm. you know, for me, it was black women, black little girls. And it was like, wow, the criminalization of black girlhood, like this is what it looks like. Mm. I saw an interview you did with Yahoo News and I thought it was fascinating when you made a point about people characterizing women who are incarcerated and yourself at the time as monsters, right? They were calling you names like that. And it dawned on me a very specific case, the case of Eileen Warnos. Ah. And of course the film monster was based on her whole life. And when you, when you really look at that film and also just the actual documentary about her, it is exactly what you've been saying. Like no one cared until she had been pushed to a point where she was doing things that were criminal, but she had been trying to get help. Society had failed her. And we time. all have to take a part in that blame. Like it's so easy to point the finger at a person that's like, oh, this is all your fault. But no, it's not everyone's fault that we're still dealing with poverty. That certain communities are still dealing with poverty, that we still have kids going to bed hungry at night, that we have children going to school so they can eat, making sure, even if it's just that one meal that they can get something to eat and they just get some respite outside of their, um, in that abnormal, maybe oftentimes violent in, in environment at mm -hmm. home, you know, mm -hmm. whatever home might look like, right? We have to know, we have to understand also, we have to be clear that drugs have impacted, you know, the black and brown community where the, the family dynamic has been torn apart. Incarceration is the top leading factor mm -hmm. in that, right? Yeah. And so we have ripped, torn families apart. So we don't have, you know, it's not all. So, you know, we like, we hear that stuff about, oh, like black people can't be good parents, like black men, you see black men loving on their children all the time. So mm -hmm. let's stop that, right? Deadbeat yeah. dads. Let's let's be very clear. And I'll say it here. The world's first deadbeat dad who taught everybody else was the white man. Like, let's be clear. You have children that look like me in this world, not <laughs> knowing who their father is. So let's be clear about deadbeat dad, where that comes from. <laughs> I'm clear about that. And, you know, and don't mean any harm with it, but we have to be really honest here. You yeah. know, so all that's a That's a part of history. Dad, yeah disparaging things that are said like you know as misnomers and stuff about you know us is wrong and so we're human beings things happen listen to children even more so concern yourself with what's going on in these individual individuals communities and their you know their homes mm -hmm. what's not going on what's not available what resources they're lacking we're, you know so we perpetuate things and then we like to blame. And so you can't tell a person, in the words of Dr. King, you can't tell a person pull themselves up by the bootstraps if they don't have a boot to pull up. That's right. That's right. Yeah. When it comes to what you did individually, though, what's, what's fascinating is while you were there in your incarceration, you educated yourself like beyond you've you maintained um your degrees in you got an associate's degree a bachelor's degree and master's was it in english i think english literature yes english literature which is amazing and so on some hand somebody might say well you know what she's the anomaly right she had a different thing and not all women are that resilient but what do you say to that if someone thinks that you're just the anomaly 
No, I'm not. <laughs> no, I'm not. No, I'm not. What it is is that the platform that um, that I helped and others helped create, and you know, with the help of you know, especially with Dan Pearson helping me um, create this platform, allowed me to for my voice to be heard even more strongly. But no, I'm not. I'm not an anomaly. I'm not unique. I'm not any of that. There are thousands upon thousands. That's why I'm fighting mm. because we have arrested brilliant, amazing minds, people, human beings. Instead of responding to the issues that have been harming them or maybe, you know, um, have not been uh, created for them, you know what I mean? These resources and opportunities, again, like people for the most part just want an opportunity like everybody else to be able to have a, a living wage, mm -hmm. sustainable, have a place to lay their heads, have food in their stomachs, clothes on their back. And if they have children, be able to have fun with their children. They just want to have a normal life. But we want to mislabel people again and make them uh, them the anomaly, right? Anomalies and say like there's something different or wrong about them, and so we have to do something different or work or or even more harmful to them, right? So incarceration, we know it is since uh, slavery, it has become <laughs> the next best thing, right? So we we incarcerate people so we can enslave them. We still continue that mentality. Um, and that um, in, a, in a physical sense, as well as a mental sense, right? Mm -hmm. So poverty continues to perpetuate this dynamic substance abuse, right? People have substance issues, right? They have substance issues because there might be some mental health, there might be some trauma, there might be some stuff. And because people can't afford medication, so they're going to self-medicate, yep. right? Yep. Marijuana, ganja, my Jamaican self call it, is the go-to thing, like, you know, a drink or whatever. And so People do these things because they know they're hurting, they're in pain, but no one's helping them with that. Yeah. You know? And we need to help each other. We need to look beyond color. We need to look beyond ethnicity. We need to look beyond language and prefer preferences, sexual preference, all this. We need to look beyond that and see the humanity, see the human being, the whole person, and understand, especially children, we have to understand what's going on in people's lives. Agreed. And especially when you think about the platform of re-entry in general, the idea of re-entry. So for people who don't know what that is, obviously we're talking about, that's the the act of a person trying to go back into society after they've served their sentence. So it's called re-entry for those who don't know. When we began recording, I mentioned to you that this has become something passionate to me because I've met people who made every attempt to re-enter after they got out of serving a sentence. And life is so difficult. It's like society was completely set up for them to return to mm -hmm. prison. They could not get a job because if they put on the application, they were in prison, the job didn't want to hire them or they feared them for whatever reason. Of course, then that means they have no place to stay because they can't afford rent. And, you know, it's just, it gets kind of crazy and crazy and crazier. So um, I, I'm wondering like, you know, how can society expect to have a better outcome when people are released if in fact, they have nothing in place for them. So then I realized for women, it's even worse, yeah. right? I mean, that's how, that's what guys experienced. So I mean, for you to make it a platform for women, what is re-entry like when women are trying to come back into society? Well, you know, women, we have some unique conditions and, and issues, right? I mean, there's the aging factor. We age differently. So they have some medical issues. There's more mental health when it comes to women, you know, um, because of our, our, when we mid, go to middle age and we start menopause, that word that we don't really talk about, that thing, right? Um, it changes the dynamic mentally, physically, emotionally, spiritually within us. Um, and then vast majority of women um, who've been incarcerated were mothers, our mothers. And so first thing that we're trying to, where's my child? Where are my children? Mm. <laughs> like, oh, how am I going to build that relationship back? Because we're relational right? We are maternal and nurturing. And so, you know, our men, we're men are more territorial ways, right? You know, for the most part and, 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 and see it differently. And so their focus is, is different from us when we come out. And so we're trying to put, put the family back, whatever that might've been before, back together and try to knit that back. So what steps do we have to hang with? You know, how do we do this? How do we do that? Um, mm -hmm. And we're trying to get that, um, that family dynamic um, together. And so that's what makes it unique because our health, mental health, you know, um, emotional health and then family and, you know what I mean? Things like that. And then the resources too. And what makes it even more difficult is because of resources that are available. We are the fastest growing population within the last 30 years that's being incarcerated, women, mm -hmm. black women, right? But we have the least resources available. 
we still have the least amount of housing. We still have the least amount of other support services. We go into spaces that are dominated by men, the old mm -hmm. and men. So like we're afterthoughts and we're like, hey, hello, you know. Right. But what about, you know, and I don't think that people are doing it intentionally. It's just the way things are. And so we become comfortable in that. And so one of the roles that we do in, in, in uh, a little piece of light, you know, it's like it's time to become uncomfortable, folks. It's time to be mm. uncomfortable because it's so comfortable for so long that we're losing it. We've yeah. lost it. And so we have to bring that back and we have to understand that everyone is equally important. We have to service everyone and individually, not so much in a group. This is not a cookie cutter kind of thing. Reentry is not a cookie cutter kind of thing. Exactly. Walk. Yes. Not, yep. You yep. know, because everyone responds to it differently, no matter your gender, no matter your preference, no matter, right? We respond to it differently. And so I have friends or, you know, folks that have been out here 20 years and they still having what I call speed bumps. It's like, whoop, something that happened is like right back in mm. you know, mentally. And it's like, it's not something that you want to do, but you don't realize because the trauma that's happened to you that you've lived through before you even got to the um, prison system and then while you were in it. And so mm -hmm. there are those dynamics, you know, and so yeah. it's really difficult for yeah women in that way. And I also know there's another family component too, which is not talked about often because the re-entry is not just a person going back into society. Now their family sort of has to adjust or they have to adjust back with their family dynamic as well. Family reunification, yes, you have. Mm -hmm. There's that. If there's any family left. Like, right, you know, right. The losses that people have, you know, and people keep throwing in our face, oh, well, if don't do the crime, if you can't do time and everything. Yeah, I would expect you to hear that, yeah. You know, and it's like, like, but I tell people, hello, guess what? 95% of people are going to come out one day or another. I don't care if it's 27 years later, 30 mm -hmm. years. People are going to come out. How do you want them to come out? How do yes. you want them to do this walk? How do you want them to be when they come out? You know, you have to consider that because everyone's not, the, the system could, it doesn't survive that way. It doesn't work that way. First of all, it's a money-making machine. So the money doesn't happen like that. Everybody's mm -hmm. stuck. Right, you know what I mean? Right. So it's an evolving kind of process, this door. And so people come out, even if it's decades later, how do you want people to come out? Most people want to come out whole and okay, want to, you know, like whatever their tone for their stuff, they've gone through that. The punishment was being taken away from society and being in a place where mm -hmm. you lost so much, right? That's the punishment, not the treatment. It shouldn't be the treatment as well. But unfortunately, the treatment is worse than the time, oftentimes, right? Yeah, yeah. So, we have to consider that. And so we put putting people back into society and saying, okay, your time is done. You're, now you have to do this. But what? How? <laughs> how? Yeah. Yeah. You treated me like an animal all these years. Or how do you expect me to be? I'm going to probably re act like one. Mm -hmm. And in interviews I've watched, I know another poignant thing you've said is how can we expect healing when you've taken someone who's already gone through Yes. Uh, abuse and violent traumas a lot of their lives and now you put them in what you call prison is a very violent environment and it's so abnormal. <laughs> yes. yes right i mean your solitary confinement was one thing you mentioned and all these things being locked down for long periods of time isolated um, and then serving out your sentence for many years um how can someone heal in that environment exactly. Exactly. seems impossible quite honestly it seems like it does the opposite Effect. I mean, you, it's, it's, it's possible. It's so difficult. It's so, you have to like, you know, so I, I'm thankful that I was in the uh, prison that I was in with a group of women that actually we had the warden, which we call a superintendent in New York, but that we had because without that, I can't be sure of that that's true. Mm. But we would be who we are and created the, the programs that exist now within the system and they're replicated you know model across the world like i'm not sure that that would be you know because she allowed us to think for ourselves mm. okay she allowed us some for some slivers of autonomy where we can think about things like the things that we know we need what would it look like if we had this what would it look like if we had the support the help what would it look like if somebody listened to us mm -hmm. so we create those spaces you know that's why a little piece of life model of a, a safe space because that's what we did we were allowed to do when we were inside and you've actually made a 501c3 corporation that's named after your book, which is um, the uh, the little piece of light is the name of the organization as well. So what are some of the initiatives that you're working on, whether it be just in theory or legislative proposals that are really going to try and change that landscape for women specifically who are reentering society? One success that 
one of the successes um, right now, most recent one, September, Governor Hochul signed our Less Is More bill, which we co-lead with two others, Patal Center and Unchained, um, into law. And so now to date, as we speak, uh, it has now allowed for the release of from uh, parole supervision, which for most people don't really need it, right? It's a waste of taxpayers' money, like $680 million a year at waste. Hmm. Um, 3,970 people been released off of parole. So released from the system entirely. Like people like me and the people that work here, you know, work for a little piece of light. Some of them are on parole. Mm -hmm. They're working, they're doing their tax paying citizens. They're doing right. Yeah. Why are you paying to have them supervised? Especially if you monitor them after a while, you see like there's a, you know, most people want to do good again. Yeah, so yeah. We're, we're happy about that. We have some other legislations that we've been a part of the DVSJA Domestic Violence Survivors Justice Act, which um, allows for a person's case to be re-adjudicated, revisited um, if they have significant amount of um, trauma, violence, you know, family violence, domestic mm -hmm. violence in their lives. Um, that's not been working as much as we would like, because of course it's like, oh, we don't want it to be a floodgate. Oh, so then you recognize the vast majority of people that have been inside have been subjected right. to kind of harm and hurt people hurt people. And mm -hmm. so we're kind of trying to heal that, to work to that, right? Um, but yeah, so we, we work on some policy stuff. We're organizers at heart. Um, we're working to close down Rikers Island. It continues to be the most violent and uh, just abnormal uh, detention uh, penal colony. Yeah. In the country. Um, it, it's, and it was, the, the, the premise of it was basically captured those those of our ancestors that ran away from being enslaved trying to get away from that harm and so they captured them and held them there so i mean it perpetuates something on itself so is that the history of rikers yes or part of that wow. look up look up mr riker and who he was and what he did very poignant final words and i appreciate it and i appreciate you and i appreciate what you're doing because again our society is better off when we make it better for people who have to re-enter into that society. Seems like a no-brainer. Can't figure out why, <laughs> you know, people haven't you done think? better. <laughs> yeah, you would think. I mean, uh, it's 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 crazy that we're still going through that. So thank you and I commend you for all the work. So Donna Hilton, thank you for being my guest today on Motivational Mondays. Thank you. It's a pleasure. It's an honor.